Hi and welcome back to Scotty's Tech.info. I'm Scotty with my co-host Cletus. Lately we've been hearing about pretty much nothing but cryptocurrencies and Bitcoin and Ethereum. Uh, Bitcoin reached like new insane record highs and of course everyone wants to get in on the crypto craze. But if you do a search to try and understand exactly like what are exactly what are cryptocurrencies, how do they work, uh, what is this blockchain that everyone is talking about, you'll probably find a whole lot of articles and videos and you start reading and they very quickly dive into all this like super technical detail like cryptographic hash functions and all this stuff. And if you're a techie that's fine. But if you're a non-techie, where do you find a just kind of down-to-earth simple explanation of the blockchain and cryptocurrencies and how they work? Well that is what I hope to provide now. So the first thing to understand is that uh, cryptocurrencies and blockchains are sort of intimately related. Uh, cryptocurrencies are based on this idea of the blockchain. Now, as its name implies, a blockchain is simply a chain of blocks. Hmm. So the first question that we need to look at is, well, what the heck is a block? What's in a block? So this is a block. It just looks like a block, and of course it contains some sort of data. So what is inside of a block? Well, for the purposes of our example, we'll say that a block contains, at the top, a date and time, a timestamp. In the middle it contains data. Now that data can be an image, it could be a video, it could be some sort of encrypted stuff. Um, it can even be transactions, like for a cryptocurrency. You know, Bob gave Sue 600 bitcoins. Yay, Sue is filthy, stinking rich now. Uh, whatever it is, it's just data. It's the data that is actually stored in the blockchain. And finally, at the bottom, we have a signature in the blue text. Now, the signature is kind of important because what it does is it actually verifies the data of the block. And this is kind of the first uh, key concept about the blockchain. So what exactly is this signature and how does it work? In order to generate the signature, what we do is we take all the other data in the block except the signature and we perform this crazy mathematical function on it. And that crazy mathematical function is going to result in a digital signature. Now the digital signature has some important features, uh, the reason why we actually use it. So here we have a sample block. It has a timestamp, January 10th, 2021, a little bit after midnight. It has a chunk of data. In this case, it's just a bunch of ones and zeros. And then of course it has a signature in blue at the bottom, E025, FB, and so on. So if we were actually to take the timestamp and the data and run our signature function on it, boom, we get the signature E025 below. Okay, well what happens if I take that same block of data but I modify a single bit. I take one of the ones in that data string and I just flip it and I make it a zero. Well, if you run the same signature function on the timestamp and the data with that one flipped bit, what you end up with is the signature in red. Oops, it's 01BF204, whereas if you look back on the left, the blue signature is E025FB. So obviously changing just one little bit in you know, megabytes, even hundreds of megabytes of data. If you flip one tiny bit, the signature will be completely different. Well, what happens if we flip two bits? Again, oops, we get a completely and utterly different signature. Now, this signature function is kind of extremely important, as you'll see in a minute. The signature actually allows us to take the block's data and when you run this signature function, it's, it's mathematical craziness. It's actually related to cryptography, encryption. So you can grab a block, you can take the timestamp of the data, run the signature function on it, and whatever your result is, you compare it to the signature that came in the block, and if they're the same, you know that no one has tampered with either the timestamp or the data in that block. That block is valid. Anyone can do this, and it's extremely fast. The thing is that if you were to actually modify the data in the block, uh, it requires a whole lot of computational power to sort of fake the signature. You can think of the signature as sort of, um, it's uh, like when you sign a check or some legal document. The reason that we still do that is because it, well, it's kind of hard to fake. If your neighbor got a hold of one of your checks and signed it, of course they can sign your name, but if anyone actually compared their signature to your real signature, it'll be pretty obvious pretty quickly that it's a forged signature. 
In a similar way, these digital signatures are extremely easy to generate. It's very easy for you to sign your signature on a check. You don't even think twice about it. And anyone can actually look at it easily and compare it. But in order to change the data in the block, and you'd have to then actually do a whole bunch of mathematical computations involving like 394 years and roomfuls of supercomputers in order to generate uh, sort of a new signature that allows you to, to modify the data. That's a little bit complicated, but uh, all you really need to understand is that the signature allows you to verify the data in the block. But it also serves another purpose. So, okay, we need a chain of blocks because it's called the blockchain. So we know we have a block and we can verify each block with its signature. But where does the chain part come from? Well, we're going to need to modify our block and include something new. We need to include the previous block signature in each of our blocks. So what does that give us? Well, now, as you can see, we have a blockchain, a chain of blocks. Now, block number one has no previous block signature. It says none in purple because it's the first block in the chain. But it does have the blue signature, which confirms the data in block one. But then looking over at block two, you see that the previous block signature points to the block signature of block one. And so on. Block three points to block two, block four points to block three, and voila, you have a blockchain. Now, what happens if we were to modify some data here? What happens to the whole blockchain? So, okay, we've changed the data in block two. Even if it's just one single bit flipped, what happens? Well, if I calculate the signature of block two, because the data has changed, suddenly that means the signature of block two also needs to be changed. But then I have a problem because block three is pointing back to the signature of block two, but that means block three's previous block signature is also now wrong. But since the signature of block three is a calculation involving all the other data in block three, including the previous block signature, which is now wrong or invalid, then suddenly we have a problem with the signature of block three and on and on it goes. So if you change any data at any point in the blockchain, it's extremely easy for anyone to verify and see that something was hacked and, uh-oh, uh, we've got a problem here. Here we have a blockchain. It's 21 blocks long. Now, as we've just seen, if I were to modify the data in block 21, of course, the signature would be invalid and I'd have to do all kinds of computations. And But, like, well, nobody would really care because it's the last chain of the block, right? So all I would have to do is kind of hack that one block and... Uh, calculate sort of a quote-unquote fake signature and then I might be able to hack it, right? But what happens if I were to modify block number six? Okay, there we go. We've changed block number six. Now since the signatures of all the blocks are linked together, which is what actually makes it a block chain, if I change anything in block six, suddenly I have to consider block seven through 21 because now they are all invalid. Oops! So now I have a problem. Okay, so we have blocks, we can verify the content of each block, and that verification of each block is actually also what links the different blocks in the chain together, such that if you futz with one of them, every block after that you have to put into question and you have to recalculate all sorts of things. It will be very obvious to anyone that something is amiss. And this is where a lot of the security of blockchains comes from. But at this point, you're probably thinking, well, okay, that's great, Scotty, but even if it requires roomfuls of supercomputers to hack the blockchain, if the blockchain is stored by, say, a central bank, well, then they might have lots of computing power, right? So they may just change it. Instead of Bob sends Sue 600 Bitcoin, they could just change it to Bob sends the International Bank of Nuttiness 600 bank coins, and then they could just recalculate the rest of the chain and say, there you go, that, that's the truth, Nothing, nothing's amiss. And, of course, no one could prove it. Well, this is where the other bit of magic of the blockchain comes into play, because the blockchain is not centralized. It's decentralized. And all that means is that literally anyone can have a copy of the blockchain. Uh, you can go on Bitcoin's website right now, and there's a link. You can download the entire blockchain, the entire Bitcoin blockchain, which is something like 300 and some gigabytes in size. Uh, it's available to anyone, anyone can have a copy, and that's kind of the whole point. It's distributed, it's not centralized. The problem comes when you want to add a new block. So let's say this is a representation. You have the internet in the middle, and you have Bob, Betty, and Bert, and they all have a copy of the blockchain because it's distributed, right? 
Well, what happens when a new block appears? How, how, I mean, what, what if like Bert says, Hey, I've got block number six and it contains a bunch of, of transactions for a cryptocurrency. He just hands his, his block number six to Bob and Betty and Bob and Betty are going, I don't know. Uh, how do I verify that that block is actually genuine? How do I know that Bert isn't trying to like steal a bunch of money from me? Cause you know, Bob, Bert and Betty could all be claiming that they have the new block six in the blockchain. So it's great that everyone can have a copy of it, but how do you actually verify a new block on the chain? Well, this is where cryptocurrency mining comes in. Now, when you hear cryptocurrency mining, what you're probably thinking of is something like this. Uh, the California gold rush, people are like playing in the mud and they're like sifting mud and water to find little bits of Bitcoin. And when they find them, they strike it rich and live happily ever after. Uh, no, that's not the kind of mining we're talking about when we refer to blockchains and cryptocurrencies. Cryptocurrency mining looks a little bit more like this. Uh, you have graphics cards, you have dedicated hardware, you have literally warehouses full of hardware doing like just quadrillions and quadrillions of calculations trying to generate and verify all these signatures and so on and so forth. So you have blockchain miners. The miners are sitting on the internet, on the blockchain network, if you will. Uh, they have a copy of the blockchain just like everyone else. But every time, let's say in the case of a cryptocurrency, uh, there's a new transaction. Well, that transaction needs to be included in a block. And then the block needs to be verified because, as I just pointed out, if Bob, Betty, and Bert are all saying, saying, well, I've got the new block, then how do you know which one of them is actually correct? How can anyone trust a new block in the blockchain? That's one of the rules of the miners. The miners don't actually mine or create new Bitcoin. What they do is they sit there on the network and they have sometimes warehouses full of graphics cards and dedicated hardware gobbling up an insane amount of electrical energy because they're sitting there calculating again and again and again all these signature functions. That's the long and the short of it. So the miner's purpose is to actually verify individual transactions and also uh, often to take those transactions, group them together into a new block on the chain. And then they have to do crazy calculations until they generate another kind of signature. And a, we'll call it a mining signature, which they include with that block. And then when they send that block out onto the chain to Bob, Bert, and Betty, Bob, Bert, and Betty can, again, do a very simple calculation to verify, ah, yes, we just got block number six, and it includes the miner's verification code, there's their, the mining signature. So boom, we do a quick calculations and we can verify that yes, this block and everything it contains is actually genuine. Now, the problem with this is that um, Bitcoin and other crypto mining requires a phenomenally huge amount of electrical energy. Uh, all the cryptocurrencies in the world, I believe to date, they use something like 76 terawatt hours per year. Now, 76 terawatt hours per year, that's 76,000 nuclear reactors. Each of the nuclear reactors running at full power for one hour. So if you took 76,000 nuclear reactors, ran them at full power for one hour, all that energy that they output over that hour, if you could collect it all together and then stretch it out over a year, that's how much energy is required for mining. And the reason is because all this signature stuff is very computationally intensive. Now you might think, well, why are the miners actually doing this? Well, they're doing it because uh, in the case of, say, cryptocurrencies, they get something for it. So every time, say, like you buy or sell in Bitcoin, there's a little mining fee that's included with it. When a miner actually verifies a block, they actually get the mining fees from all the transactions that are included in that block. And sometimes they also get a new block fee. And so, of course, it costs a lot of money to have all this hardware. And of course, the electricity costs a lot of money. So they need to sort of profit from doing all this mining. But the mining process itself is actually distributed. It's not just one miner. It, there's multiple giant groups of miners. And so there's not really one central authority who's actually doing the verification. It's supposed to be distributed. And so there you go. Now the miners have done their job and Bob, Bert, and Betty all have block number six and they can all verify that everything is kosher. Okay, so there you have it. You have a block, you have a blockchain, you have mining, you have a way where everyone can verify the transactions, you have 
distri a distributed network. Everyone has a copy of it. Uh, it's very difficult for anyone to fake a, a part or a whole of the blockchain. Um, it's pretty cool. In any case, it gets kind of complicated because this whole mining process, that's actually a verification process. It requires a lot of energy. Um, this is called proof of work. Other cryptocurrencies use things like proof of stake. Uh, there's this idea of a proof of burn. Uh, even cryptos are, it gets really complicated. The, each individual block, in, for example, Bitcoin, it's not just a timestamp in transactions. There's all kinds of other stuff going on inside the block. So my explanations were obviously oversimplified, but hopefully they were a bit easier to understand. So there you have it. That is what blockchains and cryptocurrencies are all about. In the end, it's not really that complicated um, when you kind of look at it in terms of, you know, signatures and bank accounts and that sort of thing. It's just a little bit newfangled, and it is actually distributed. It is very secure, and, uh, well, we'll see what happens with cryptocurrencies in the future. For more techie tips, see scottystech.info. Thanks for watching. See you next time.